Communist Party of China, the CPC, the party, celebrates its 95th anniversary on July 1st, 2016. But it still mystifies foreigners that the CPC continues to be China's ruling party for almost seven decades and that the CPC has brought about China's dramatic development, lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty and rejuvenating the nation as a global power. A partial solution to this mystery is the quality of party personnel. How does the party select, train, monitor, assess, and promote officials? There's also the dark side. How does the party fight corruption, extravagance, and abuses of power? The answers, opening up the party's inner sanctum of personnel management, bring us closer to China. What are the primary characteristics of China's system for appointing party cadres or government officials? The current selection and promotion system for Chinese cadres has four features. First of all, the party should put all the cadres under its leadership. We're not saying, of course, that we as the ruling party should concern itself with everything the cadres are doing. We just pay attention to four aspects. Number one is the direction the party decides. All the work the cadres do should guarantee we're on the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Number two, all the cadres should carry out the party's policies, because policy and tactics are the lifeline of the party. All the fundamental policies are made by the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. No any other party organizations at all other lower levels should formulate any other policies contradictory to the central committees. Number three is the party system. We have strict system of cadre's appointment, shift of position, recall, and etc. Different levels of the party organizations may work out their work system according to their different situation. Other administrative departments at the same level must not develop their own cadre system willfully. Number four is the management of important cadres, especially those who play crucial role in administration and governance of the country. We put our cadres from the central down to provinces, cities, and counties under the management in accordance to their levels and sectors. The second feature for the selection and promotion system is that virtue and talent are both counted as important parameters for assessment, with virtue coming first. This is the ultimate standard for our selection and appointment of cadres. General Secretary Xi Jinping has made it more concrete, that is, firm in faith, ready to serve the people, diligent and practical, brave in shouldering responsibilities, clean and honest. The third feature is democracy, transparency, and public recognition and approval. People's satisfaction is a major indicator of whether the cadre's selection and promotion uphold transparency, justice, and fairness. For example, we take democratic recommendation as a must for selecting and appointing cadres and make announcement in advance the cadre's assessment survey and appointment as an important measure so that the whole process is undertaken in transparency. The fourth feature is working according to the laws under supervision. Now at the national level, we have the civil servant law of the People's Republic of China. Within the party, we have a series of regulations for selecting and appointing party and government leaders. In the meantime, Party organization departments at central and lower levels all have websites and hotline for the masses to report. We want to make our cadre selection and appointment more scientific, democratic, and legalized. How has the process of cadre and official selection and appointment uh, changed over time? What were some of the deficits or problems in the past, and how have they been improved? Back at the evolution of our selection and appointment mechanism, 
I'd like to say we have kept three elements unchanged and three modified. As for the unchanged, we have maintained the principle provising the cadres. Stuck to our emphasis on both virtue and talent, with virtue being the top priority, and adhere to appointments based on democratic centralism. Then there are three changes. First, we have diversified ways of selection. For a long time in the past, almost everyone was a directly appointed cadre. Recently, we have combined multiple ways of appointment. By commission, election, an appointment by engagement to develop a diversified system, so that can bring the best out of each method. This new practice places us in a better position for cadre selection and appointment. Second, we have expanded the scope of involvement in cadre selection and appointment. In the past, we had a narrow scope of selection of cadres, only among a limited minority for us to select, which had led to some dissatisfaction of the people. Now, with 30 years of reform and opening up, people have now been enjoying a greater right of participation, voting, and supervision. Openness, justice, fairness—all these key concepts have become tangible features in our routine work of selecting. And appointing cadres. So even though the current selection practice is more time-consuming and costly for our organization departments, public satisfaction with our work has increased together with the quality of personnel. Third, the past selection and appointment process was not highly systemic or legalized. But now things have changed. We officially put the civil servant law of the People's Republic of China in practice in 2006, and relaxed work regulations concerning party and government cadre selection to ensure that we have laws to abide by. We have thus strengthened scientific guidance, democratic practice, and legal compliance. These are the three major changes. Process by which China selects, trains, and appoints its officials in the government and in the party, and what are the special characteristics uh, of uh, China's system? With many years of practice and exploration, particularly after our reform and opening up, we have developed a cadre selection mechanism that has a diversified structure and different elements complementing each other. There are four parts in total. The first is a democratic election system that is the same as international practices. We follow relevant regulations and charters to elect the leading cadres through democratic election. The party committee members, the leaderships of our people's congresses, governments, and political consultative conferences at all levels. As well as leading figures in charge of various government departments, are all elected through democratic mechanism. Positions through democratic election all come with a term, usually of five years. This is the first form. The second is appointment by commission. Which, however, is not really the traditional practice of appointment from above. We combine appointment from above with recommendation and assessment from below. We now rely mainly on the second option to select our party and government officials. To do this, motions. Democratic recommendations, on-site investigations, and collective discussions are needed for the final decision. 
The third is examination selection. Selecting cadres in China used to refer to the examination for candidates to become civil servants so as to work at various party and government departments. We currently have a saying, that is, anyone who wants to enter the civil servant troops must take part in examination. In recent years, we have expanded this selection scope with open selection and competition for posts. According to a position's requirements, we combine the organization's recommendation with public recommendation, as well as examination investigation to select cadres through competition. This has become one of the basic mechanisms for our cadre selection. The last form is appointment by engagement, which is designed for certain leading positions that have a requirement for technical expertise or other special qualities. We recruit them with contracts for a general term of five years. Extension of employment for more terms is also allowed. Therefore, the current cadre selection system in China is centered on a democratic election and appointment by commission with examination and engagement or recruitment as their complements. These four aspects have formed the basic framework of our system with Chinese characteristics. The process by which the CPC selects leaders and assesses their uh, capacity for promotion, and in particular from yours at the party school, for training leaders and future leaders. The CPC has unique qualities that empower the party to accomplish goals that others cannot. I believe there are very many reasons. But the quality of our party cadres is a very important one for the party's fighting capability. Of course, every party member needs time to improve his quality. The same is true for party leaders. They also need to keep studying and improving their capability. Therefore, in my view, a greater advantage of the CPC to other parties is that it attaches more importance to studying and training. For instance, our party schools are set up everywhere, from the central party committee down to county party organizations. Even some big enterprises and universities have their own party schools. These party schools' main task is training party cadres. The training courses include the party's theories, guiding principle and policies, as well as up-to-date knowledge of the economy, law, science, technology, and international knowledge. I should say the courses taught at party schools at all levels are rich in content that the cadres need in their daily work. Every cadre has to study in the party school for at least three months per five years. This is a strict rule to be followed. If not, one may lose the opportunity to be promoted. As a matter of fact, many cadres are willing to learn because they are aware of the benefits of learning, not only for their career development, but also for their promotion. I think this system of education is crucial in ensuring that our cadres at leading posts can correctly understand decisions and guidelines from the top and get multiple knowledge they need to perform well at their posts. But of course, apart from learning at party schools, other forms of studying also takes place at work. For example, we have a monthly studying event in the Politburo of the CPC Central Committee and local party committees also have followed the example very well. I believe such measures for learning are necessary for leading cadres.
The Party School of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China in Beijing, also known as the Central Party School, is the higher education institution which specifically trains cadres for the Communist Party of China. It was established as the CPC Central Committee's Marx School of Communism in Rajin, Jiangxi, in 1933. Many CPC's top leaders have been the president of the party school, which include Chairman Mao Zedong, president, and now CPC's party secretary Xi Jinping's presidential time from 2007 to 2013. The Central Party School focuses on the study of the system of theories of socialism with Chinese characteristics, and aims to improve the theoretical quality of students. There are more than 1,100 staff members working at the Central Party School now, and there are around 1,600 students at school for each semester. Cadres at the ministerial or provincial and prefectural levels, as well as secretaries of county-level city party committees, young and middle-aged reserve cadres, and cadres of ethnic minority groups are being trained at the school. Graduate students for doctors or master's degrees in the disciplines of Marxist theory and teachers from nationwide party schools also study at the school as well. If I were a party cadre and I, somebody hoped I'd be promoted and I'm in my mid-career and I come to the party school and you're one of my professors, what program, what would be my life for the three months or so that I would be at the party school? There are two types of party schools. One is training party cadres for promotion. The courses are mainly designed for mid-level and young cadres. It may be a bit time-consuming. It could be as long as one year or as short as half a year. The other type is for party cadres to take turns to train for different subjects, which is not directly related to promotion. This learning process may be shorter, sometimes two months, sometimes three. But however long, the courses are essentially the same. For example, the party's theories, Marxism, Mao Zedong thought, socialist theory with Chinese characteristics, these are compulsory for every party cadre. Then they have to learn the party's major guiding principles and policies, such as the Central Committee's decisions on reform, the legal system, and the five major development concepts raised by Party General Secretary Xi Jinping. These are all up-to-date important components of learning at party schools and every party cadre is obliged to learn. There are also courses on the nature of the party, for example, the party building up, which includes the party organization building, the party's working style, what to develop, and how to develop. The party's history is also taught to today's cadres. The wisdom of Chairman Mao and his comrades is worth learning. The generation of Mao Zedong and his comrades has made huge contributions to the world. The disciplines and rules they set up are very useful in teaching cadres today. Apart from those courses, they can also pick up knowledge needed for modernization like knowledge of technology, the economy, and professional expertise on the Internet at party schools. These knowledge, I believe, are very useful in politics as they can make party cadres aware of the party's requirements and how they can acquire these knowledge to meet those requirements. If a party cadre is to take office as a party secretary or a mayor, the courses at the party school can help him grasp new things needed for the position. Therefore, such learning should be very helpful. We have a rule that one has to get trained for at least four and a half months at a central party school in order to be promoted to provincial or ministerial levels. Otherwise, he stands no chance. Of course, such courses are not open to everybody. One has to have the qualifications for promotion and get approval from the organization department of the CPC Central Committee before he can take the courses. How does the CPC work on the supervision of party members, party cadres or officials, and also government officials? The CPC's supervision over party cadres has two parts. 
The first is the Discipline Inspection and Supervision Department that is responsible for discipline supervision and discipline investigation. The other is the Organization and Personnel Department that is responsible for cadre supervision, which is operated under a structure of well-linked working systems. Please allow me to make some introductions. The first system is about leading groups meeting. We call it democratic life meeting. There are two kinds of leading groups democratic life meetings. One is regularly held at the beginning or at the end of the year annually. The other is held when some special problems come out for settlement. The main purpose of the democratic life meeting is for the leading group to find problems in their work. When the meeting is held, the masses are invited to raise problems. Each member of the leading group looks for problems in his work. The higher authority points out their existing problems, and leading group members help each other to find problems. The next step is to carry out criticism and self-criticism among leading group members. This is not only our party's time-honored tradition, but also an important method to strengthen supervision within the party, especially mutual supervision between leading cadres. When the leading group's democratic life meeting is held, both the Discipline Inspection Department and the Organization and Personnel Department should send their representatives to participate. The second system is for leading cadres to report on clean and honest governance. When a leading cadre submits his annual report on his own assessment of his work in the year, he should also report on how he adhered to the party's requirement, to a clean and honest governance, and to good morality. All this should be subjected to the appraisal of the masses. The third system is that of leading cadre's economic responsibility audit. In the past, when the leading cadre leaves his post, relevant organization departments will cooperate with auditing authorities to audit his economic responsibilities. Now we audit not only those who are leaving, but also those in office on a regular basis. Every three years we do one audit, and every audit lasts three years. This is the method through which we enhance the supervision of economical responsibilities of leading cadres. The fourth is the system of reminding, inquiring through mailing, and persuading and admonishing cadres. This is a system of warning and supervision targeted at leading cadres who have committed mistakes, but not to the extent of breaking laws and regulations. The fifth is the system of accountability, which can be found in China and Western countries alike. If leading cadres make a wrong decision and cause huge losses or create negative influences, we demand that they make a public apology or even remove them from their post, depending on the severity of the situation. In addition, we have been practicing inspection tour within the party in recent years, which, as an important way of supervision, have been proven to be effective. In addition to the anti-corruption campaign that looks for law-breaking and criminal activity, the party has instituted uh, programs and procedures regarding work style and personal behavior that's short of a crime. The eight regulations that came out early after the 18th Party Congress in uh, recent years, the uh, three stricts, as it's called, and three honests. Which, how have these programs uh, improved the behavior of party members?
In recent years, our efforts at strengthening parties' working style and fighting corruption have impressed all party members. And the most impressed is the eight provisions put forward by the CPC Central Committee. I summarize three characteristics of the provisions. First, superiors setting themselves as role models for subordinates. This was demanded by the CPC Central Committee. Politburo members take the lead and report their implementation of the regulations within the party annually. They have set a good example for the whole party. The second characteristic is paying attention to small things. What the eight provisions forbids are things overlooked in the past, such as treats and gifts and extravagant banquets. Some may not seem very costly or make common quantities not large enough to break the rules. But it is these very phenomena that can be breeding grounds for violations of law and regulations. We start to deal with these seemingly ordinary and small things to foster a clean and just environment in the party and promote a sound atmosphere nationwide. The third characteristic is to focus our attention first on the problems listed in the eight provisions. We know that the eight provisions has its limits. It cannot cover all the problems that hinder the establishment of the party's working style and fighting corruption. But we can start from education and practice campaigns and fight the four undesirable working styles of formalism, bureaucracy, hedonism and extravagance to curb the emergency of more serious problems. Some problems listed in the eight provisions are not really new and have been dealt with in the past. But in the past, we did not focus on these problems and keep on fighting to root them out. But this time, we're determined to resolve these problems. Now, the implementation of the eight provisions has generated fruitful results since its promulgation. Positive comments prevail both within and outside the party. This is by no means a strike of luck, but rather a natural result of a correct prescription. China has a long history of recruiting its best and brightest into public service. A dedicated process that the CPC has adapted for contemporary times. Not well known in the West, the CPC's organization department is responsible for selecting, training, monitoring, assessing, and promoting party and government officials and, when necessary, for demoting or firing them. The process is rigorous, quantitative, and continuous, with increasing transparency and broad-based participation. Training is intense and career-long. Rules of work style and personal behavior are firmer. An eight-point regulation rejects extravagance and reduces bureaucratic visits, meetings, and empty talk. A training campaign stresses strictness in morals, power, and self-discipline, and honesty in decisions, business, and behavior. For over 27 years, I've been meeting Chinese officials at all levels, including a just-completed 12-day study in Zhejiang and Qinghai provinces. And, in general, Chinese officials are some of the most competent administrators anywhere. That's closer to China. Thank you.